Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, thanks for those of you who are joining us online. Um, my name is Anand Soki. I am the director of DEI here. And um, I want to start by reading a quick acknowledgement, and then I'm going to introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, the University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, uh, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or re rectify the devastation wrought on Indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with Indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally we will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of Indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty and their work, educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating Indigenous knowledge, and consulting, engaging, and working collaborative, collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us. So today we have uh, Dr. Colleen Scanlon Lyons. Uh, Dr. Lyons is an associate prof research professor in the Department of Environmental Studies here at the University of Colorado Boulder. She also serves as the project director for the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, the co director of the Laboratory for Energy and Environmental Policy Innovation and is a research associate with the Environment and Society program here at IBS. She is a cultural anthropologist who focuses on tropical forest conservation, sustainable development, and social movements. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker. Thanks, Colleen, for being here. Hi, thank you so much. So it is such a pleasure to be here because IBS is, has, has been my home for quite a while. However, it's my new official home, and it's now the home of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force. It's a very big mouthful that you had to say there. We call it the GCF Task Force. And so today I'm going to talk about what the GCF Task Force is. If you look at the most recent organizational chart that uh, Lori Hunter sent out after our town halls, you'll see there's a box on there, and it says GCF Task Force. And when we had our environment and society meeting last week, a couple of people were like, what is the GCF task force? So I'm going to open the black box today and talk about the GCF task force. I will also get into a little bit of my own research, but it's mainly, um, I'm, today I'm focusing on what is the GCF? How can we use this global platform within IBS? And the whole point is to give you lots of different ideas and I see some collaborators out there, even collaborators from Brazil, that we can um, spur on different, uh, different project ideas. Also, uh, to, uh, to kind of frame this in the beginning, I am primarily a Brazilianist. I've been working in Brazil for over 30 years. And so while you will learn that the GCF task force has a global reach, a lot of my examples are going to be from Brazil. So today we're gonna to talk about Framing, engaging, and communicating about social environmental work. As I mentioned, we'll talk about the GCF task force. What does communicating looking like and what, what does communicating look like working with social environmental leaders? And then we'll end on opportunities within IBS, which will hopefully spark a really good conversation. And Cindy, can you keep me apprised of time? Actually, I might even grab my phone so I don't go on too long. Okay. Few of you, why should we care about tropical forests and climate change? Any ideas out there? And if not, I'm going to call in the grad students in the room <laughs> who have their mouth full. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, the lungs of the world. Hillary. Exactly. So it's all of these reasons and more. More than a billion people depend on tropical forests for their livelihoods. 
They're crucial for local communities, for indigenous peoples. Conserving these ecosystems is really key if we're going to stay under the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Climate Agreement. And as you were saying, the carbon, uh, the carbon emissions that we are trying to limit with, within our world right now are really dependent on the presence of tropical forests. This is all from the Biden climate plan, which was kind of fun to actually Google this online and find that our current administration was citing all of these reasons. They actually have a 30 page um, tropical forest kind of manifesto or plan for action. So um, that's, a, that's a really nice transition in our political leadership. So tropical forests are really important. However, we, to be really honest, are losing the battle against uh, avoided deforestation or reducing tropical deforestation. In Brazil, um, tropical deforestation is rising rapidly. Indonesia is actually a success case of places where tropical forest has been declining and they are uh, entering into new agreements because of that. And when we think about tropical deforestation and showing progress of reducing deforestation, that affects a host of different programs that are connected to tropical deforestation. So it not only affects the air we breathe, the water we drink, livelihoods, places people live, it affects how funding is flowing or not flowing to places that are showing a reduction in deforestation. And one case that I can briefly talk about, Indonesia recently signed an agreement with the government of Norway to increase funding for defore to um, work on their avoided deforestation because they're actually reducing their numbers. Whereas Brazil right now is talking about carbon markets and carbon markets are linked to reducing deforestation. And if you're not reducing deforestation, you're not gonna get funding for all of the reasons that we need tropical uh, forest conservation. So these are just some stats recently. Um, Thomas Lovejoy, who recently passed away, was really a pioneer on the tipping point and is showing that we're not doing well. The Amazon is a really critical tropical forest. If we lose the Amazon, we lose the global battle against climate change. It's, it's as simple as that, but we're not doing real well. And this is something that um, the GCF task force works on every single day. Another interesting piece of data that I recently found from four days ago, and this was on Manga Bay, a lot of people like to say, well, deforestation is just related to poverty. If you are poor, you're going to cut down trees. In some cases, that could be true in different communities. But a recent study by, um, and I can cite this study for folks that are interested, by researchers in the Amazonian state of Amapá, Brazil, was looking at municipal data on poverty and found that there is not a correlation here. So that already is an interesting piece of, of information that can then be turned into political action. Um, cutting down the Amazon does not build prosperity for most Brazilians. It builds prosperity for large companies. It builds prosperity for the global elite, but the everyday family farmer who is cutting down a tree or a hectare or five hectares of forest is not gaining significantly from this. So we'll get into what do we do about that? Um, and the other graph up here I really did like because it talks about a little bit for fuzzy there, but fossil fuel, climate change, deforestation, demand for resources. So deforestation is not just a singular thing. It doesn't just depend on trees. It really brings in livelihoods, biodiversity services, ecosystem services. It's viewed as much more of a holistic um, thing. So the governor's climate and task force was born in 2008, 2009 with our friend from California. I always like to use this picture. It brings up laughter of, wow, the Terminator started this group of governments to look at reducing deforestation and promoting low emissions development. So the 
overall goal and mission of the GCF is subnational leadership on the climate, climate and forest agenda. There have been some citations recently or statistics recently that the UN has said over 30% of climate action is going to happen at the subnational level. Getting to the national level, difficult. Getting to the international level, really difficult. But you can get to governors, and governors are important because they have jurisdiction across an entire state or province. So DCF has gone, we started with 10 states and provinces. California brought together five Brazilian states. So five of the 10 founding members were from the Brazilian Amazon, uh, along with Aceh and Papua from Indonesia, and Wisconsin and Illinois from the United States. This was back in 2009. They're no longer on the map because they're well, Illinois is up there. They haven't officially dropped out. Wisconsin officially dropped out during a political administration that was much more conservative. Illinois has just been kind of a latent member. But the key here is California's leadership. California is, I think it's the fifth or the sixth largest, I think it's the fifth largest economy in the world. The way California goes with politics, and you've seen this with their recent, um, the recent uh, declaration on car manufacturing, the way California goes is the way much of the world goes. And so if they're going in a kind of a progressive environmentally friendly path and having the leadership of California is really, really important. So today over 14 years, we've grown from 10 states and provinces to 39 in 10 countries. We've got the entire Brazilian Amazon, most of Indonesians or, or much of Indonesia's forests, most of the Peruvian Amazon, and then um, a good chunk of Mexico's tropical forests. Together, this group, this network is one third of the world's tropical forests. So if you want to work at a subnational governmental network level, these are folks that you want to get engaged with. seen the top up here. Um, who is, this basically says, who is the GCF task force? Can we move around that thing? That would be great. Um, okay, thank you, Cindy. So who is the GCF task force? Everybody always asks this. They're like, how do you work with a government? How do you work with a, an entire state or province? The way we work, um, which is critical, is we have membership. So governors are our members, but then each state and province has two delegates. And this is super key for future research because in places like Brazil, one of the two delegates is the secretary of the environment. So these are people that have power, manage up to the governor, they manage down to civil servants. And the other uh, member is an everyday civil servant, like a technician that really knows a lot about forest conservation, about carbon, about biodiversity, about the issues that we're dealing with. Now, this is also a really key part uh, appointed by the governor. The reason that we want the governor to say the secretary of the environment and somebody else in my administration is my delegate is that creates political buy-in. If we have a network where you've got some governors and then we got some members and nobody knows who each other are and they don't talk to each other or the members don't have power to go and knock on the governor's door and say, here's what's going down. This is why we need to work on reducing deforestation in a place like Amazonas, Brazil, then it doesn't work as well. So by having key secretaries involved all over the world, that's, um, that's part of our kind of our theory of change. We operate in five different languages. It's like a tiny little UN, nobody speaks English. Um, I think in my entire tenure with the GCF, there's been one delegate that has spoken English and that's it. Uh, Marta, my colleague here, knows this because she's dealing with translation all the time. But the key point here is if you're truly going to have participation, this can't be some top-down thing where people are speaking in English and it's like, all right, figure this out. We have to have dialogue and discussion across different groups with people speaking in their own language. Okay, Mara, question. <laughs>
No, it's actually, that's a great question. We have never gone out and said, join, join the club. This is great. Come on in. It has totally been self-selecting. And we had, is there Uttar Pradesh in India? Come to several of our meetings, register to be an observer. We have very um, pr pretty distinct membership rules. You can't just come on in and say, I want to join. You have to observe for a year. You have to go to the meetings. You have to decide if this is an agenda that your government's going to take on. Then you have to endorse some key declarations that we have on reducing deforestation, on working with indigenous peoples. And they were pretty interested before COVID and have just kind of gone away. But it's not, it's not been a decision on our part to say, we want to keep them out. Now, working with Brazil, remember, they were five of the 10 founding members. And we realized that, gosh, if we can get the entire Brazilian Amazon, that's more power. Right now, what's being debated in Brazil is if we open to other tropical forest ecosystems like the Atlantic forest. So there's, there's some debate going on with that. Um, and it's just organically grown. We have a number of members that are coming in from Bolivia, they're observers, and we vote on new members once a year. So, and to be voted in, there's a whole lot of governance stuff, but to be voted in, one of the founding members has to endorse you. So remember, there's only nine of them is the thing. So, because Wisconsin's gone. So we've got nine founding members, which isn't that many. Five are Brazilian, couple Indonesian, California. Okay, where were we? Talked about membership. This is key. Um, we have now, this is the reason I'm actually giving this talk within IBS. The GCF was born with our members and it was housed in the University of Colorado Law School for many years because the lead of the GCF professor, William Boyd, was a law school professor. So it was kind of this random, we've got an academic home, but this global subnational network, but it worked very, very well because it provided us with a neutral spot. We weren't carrying one NGO's flag or another NGO's flag. We could do research on the GCF. Professor Boyd has moved to UCLA. I've stayed here. So we have now decided to split the secretariat between UCLA and CU IBS. So the GCF is now formally housed within IBS. And the reason that I'm talking about the Emmett Institute here, UCLA and the Congo Basin Institute, is those are like-minded allies at UCLA. So when you put your research hats on and you're like, well, I actually work in the Congo. All right, we've got connections over there. How can we think about interinstitutional, interdisciplinary research using the GCF as a platform? The other key thing is, and I talked about membership, it's very ground up membership. We have uh, four main regions, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, and Peru. And we have people that work in each of these places that work full-time for the GCF. And they work with partners like Funbio, SIAT, which is part of the CIGAR system. They work with an NGO in Mexico, Prana Sur, an NGO in Peru. The woman who is the, the GCF uh, regional lead in Peru is the former minister of the environment. Hillary's nodding her head because she is, pardon my French, a total badass. She's awesome. Fabiola is, she's right now planning a meeting for 500 people next week that may have the president of Peru come, which brings a whole other political, political considerations we then have to deal with. Um, and in, in, we have very strong leadership. So working with these regions is something I wanted to highlight so that you can think about connections going forward um, with your research. We've got four main things we do with the GCF, and I'm just going to keep them really, really simple here so we can get to questions. Uh, promote subnational capacity building. So that means working with governments, working with governors, working with secretaries. When we have the COP in Egypt, we're traveling with governors, we're traveling with secretaries, we're getting them engaged in key meetings. And some of it is high-level panels where it can make public 
uh, commitments. I was speaking with uh, the head of the Andes Amazon Initiative for the Moore Foundation a couple of weeks ago, and she said, well, what do you do with the governors? And I said, part of this is being able to expose them to this global agenda. Another part is accountability. When you are in a global space making a promise to reduce deforestation in your state or province, as difficult as that can be, there's an element of holding people's feet to the fire and saying, you made this statement here. You endorsed whatever declaration we have. You said that you would follow these guiding principles. So there's both exposure to this agenda as well as some accountability. We also promote policy development. Each of our states and provinces has, over the past couple of years has spent time developing strategies. What does reducing deforestation look like? How do we promote bioeconomy in our state or province? What laws or policies need to be in place to actually have teeth beyond political administrative change? Because we know that that happens every four years or every eight years. We also work on fostering financing and investment. And a lot of that, the financing and investment flows if states and provinces can show that they're reducing deforestation, if they have policies in place, if they have good partnerships. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of donors are not going to park money in a tropical forest government, which makes sense, but how do we have partnerships that can help with implementation of specific policies and plans and really make these things happen? And then finally, really exciting. We have worked with indigenous peoples and local community leaders for many, many years. And now it is a part of our mandate for the next several years. So we have a specific program area working with, as we call, as we say, we just kind of shorten it to IPLCs, which is really important. We've got um, ways of working with IPLCs that I'll get into in just one minute. So engaging with subnational governmental leaders can have an impact because of the role that these leaders play. This is Governor Viana of uh, former Governor Viana of Acre, Brazil, meeting with the head of NREL. Governor Viana came to the University of Colorado, brought a delegation of 10 people, stayed here for three weeks, learned some English, learned all about more tropical forest conservation stuff, met with high-level leaders here, and Acre has always been one of the leaders in the GCF for their forest uh, policies. This is Governor Valdez and Governor Babalio of Amazonas and Pará. Pará right now is where much of the donor community is looking at, be it for carbon markets, be it for investment. It is where it's kind of on the front lines of the deforestation battle. There's a lot of complex issues going on in Pará. Uh, and they are showing a commitment that they had made passing that on to the Pope. So these guys, and I will say they're all guys right now. At one point, we have had one governor um, from Brazil. I'm trying to remember which, I think she was Hondonia. And we did have a female governor, but right now 39 men are, are, are governors right now. We are working on our gender issues within the GCF. Uh, but they have access to key leaders, key global leaders. The other reason is a jurisdictional approach, which you can implement when you're working with states and provinces. If you think about a project and a project and a project and a project, the impact of those individual project projects sometimes can be much less than a governor saying, here's how we do this in my state. We are going to implement a state system of ecosystem services and a law, and that can have much more scale and impact, which we, all, we know we need to get to. Engaging by speaking out and bridging different governmental spaces. When the government of California was debating their tropical forest standard, and if that should go forward or not, we brought indigenous leaders uh, that are very involved with the GCF and Chico Mendez's daughter, Chico Mendez is a big and uh, and a, a martyr uh, in Bra the Brazilian environmental community who was uh, murdered in 1988 in the state of Acre. But we brought about what forest conservation, viewing people as part of the forest and not just trees, all of those things that mattered to her. So she's testifying 
testifying here in front of the California Air Resources Board. So working with people is really key. And then engaging by resetting historically difficult and often unlikely relationships. As we heard in the land acknowledgement when we were uh, starting this, this talk, government and indigenous peoples don't have a great history. There is a long, long history of colonialism, of disproportionate power. And we have figured out a way to work with indigenous leaders and work with our governments and our governors and try and get them to come together. The way we did that was we founded a global IPLC committee, which spans the entire GCF network. And then we have regional committees in the four main, main places that the GCF works, which you know unites governments, IPLCs, NGOs. And this actually is an endorsement of what are called guiding principles for collaboration and partnership between governments and indigenous peoples and local community leaders. So when new governors come in, as they do, yesterday there was an election in Peru, there was an election in Brazil, we say, welcome. Here's the GCF, this is what we believe in, you're part of this global network, but if you're gonna be part of the network, you need to endorse these principles. And right now, it's back to holding their feet to the fire, working on implementation of these principles, because endorsement, that's a great first step, but you know what, it really has to go into practice. And how do we do that? Through these committees, because these committees are led by indigenous leaders, and they can say, well, wait a minute, you're part of the GCF, and these principles, here's where we see them going awry. Here are ways that we can work together better. Um, and interestingly, at this, in this picture here on the lower left, for those of you that are at home, um, we were endorsing the guiding principles that were developed by our committees. Meanwhile, there was a 300 person protest taking place outside the building against governments and indigenous peoples saying they can't work together. And it was, it was a pretty dramatic moment. Democracy Now! was involved. And we had Governor Brown meeting in, in private with our indigenous leaders. So we kind of take the world as we find, find it and try and get these governments to work together better uh, with their key constituents. So engaging with contemporary conservation issues and debates, these are each of these merits its own lecture, but carbon market opportunities, risks, challenges. Right now, the LEAF coalition, huge deal. It's been announced, this is a coalition of the US, the government of Norway and the UK um, around red plus transactions. Well, everybody's selling this. We work with our government not good for us. We need upfront financing to prepare the laws and policies. This, you can't just come and drop this on our laps and expect subnational governments who often lack capacity to be able to jump into arrangements with these carbon market actors. So we come at this from a very uh, thoughtful, critical at times, very critical perspective of what can, what does a good, uh, does a good carbon credit look like for indigenous peoples? Is it truly engaging with the realities of subnational governments? So we oftentimes end up serving as a convening voice, force for these voices. Land tenure and community-based conservation, a big area that we're working in, forest governments, payment for ecosystem services, safeguards. Again, there's just all of these different areas that we could go down quite a path and do lots of research and apply projects. We also have new partnerships that are pretty key. We recently signed an agreement with USAID Brazil, and we're working with them on bioeconomy development, as well as new educational opportunities between Brazilian institutions and US institutions. Another thing that we could do with IBS. Uh, I work pretty closely with the Climate Land Use Alliance and regional committees for IPLCs, but they're trying to figure out how can we have the most impact with our funding. The Climate and Land Use Alliance is a consortium of big donors like Ford Foundation, and, um, Hewlett Packard, it's a, a Moore Foundation. 
So they pool their money and they're trying to figure out, gosh, there's carbon market debates here. There's this network over here. How do we get IPLC voices included in some of the big global debates? So that's working through our, our committees. And then this is really key. Each state and province has its own set of relationships. So in Pará, the Nature Conservancy is working a lot. In the state of Amazonas, we've got the Fundação Amazonas Sustentável. Each state has their own NGO actors. And that's really, really important for us because oftentimes states have limited capacity and NGOs can provide technical assistance and they can also serve as ways to park money that will then work with the states and help implement these policies or get, get them going. So moving on from engaging to communicating. Uh, this is an area that I'm really excited about and within IBS, I wanna do more of this. We've been to, I shouldn't have brought that book, it's in my office, co-author publications with indigenous leaders, with governmental leaders, with NGO leaders. And that's been kind of fun because it's not me writing about what the government of California's arrangement with the Yurok tribe looks like. It's at the time, Jason Gray, who was with the California Air Resources Board, and he's now my co-director at UCLA, and Javier Kinney of the Yurok tribe writing an article on how they have developed their relationship. It's Magali Maderos, who was within the government of Acre, collaborating with Francisca, who's an indigenous leader in Acre, and she's now in Acre. How do we use traditional and non-traditional forms of communication to disseminate and to educate and to build capacity around back to our primary goal, tropical forest conservation and low emissions development. Writing position papers. Recently, um, Jason that I just mentioned wrote a position paper on what um, the government, our, our governmental arrangement with, with China would look like around tropical deforestation. So using this as a forum for scholarship. And we're also going to conduct research on relevant forest and climate issues. I'm working on a new project with Pete Newton in environmental studies. And this is all around COVID and forest. When COVID comes into these forested regions, how does health intersect with deforestation, intersects with economic development? So how, you know, what are we, what does resilience look like in these communities? Um, what are the practices of forest citizenship around COVID-19 experiences? In fact, one super interesting side note that you could Google, the government, uh, Secretary of the Environment for Amazonas, Secretary for Environment, because he had international connections, became the front man for COVID relief efforts in the state of Amazonas. So he was getting oxygen concentrators to these uh, remote regions of the Amazon, not because he was the secretary, of, but because he had connections uh, internationally. Another thing, community, I think is really, really big. This is not a formal book launch here at IBS, but I just finished my book, Running After Paradise, which is looking at a whole other tropical forest uh, region of Brazil, but it's looking across different communities of actors. So how can you have environmental actors together with land reform activists, quilombola activists, and nativos who are looking at large scale, scale development, who are looking at forest conservation, and I've really been trying to find new forms of communication. So this book is written quite uh, differently from typical ethnographies. And it really tries to feature the voices of the people in these places. Okay, last slide or last two slides. And I think I'm perfectly on time here. Opportunities with IBS. So in brainstorming, and this is where I need your help. These are some opportunities I see. Uh, the, the GCF and new forms of communicating, new forms of engagement, even beyond the GCF, thinking about forests, really goes across, it goes into environment and society, but it also goes way beyond. As I was saying, our project on COVID and health, it definitely can uh, span issues around population, around international development. So how different programs in IBS is one of my questions. Another 
place that I will offer for increased scholarship is looking at data. You've got data for one third of the world's tropical forests. And a lot of this data is publicly available. Sometimes it's hard to find, sometimes it's hard to verify, but if we can use governors, if we can use secretaries of the environment to get that data and say, all right, what does that tell us about your poverty or land tenure? What, uh, what about some social science data? When we lose a good governor, meaning a pro forest conservation governor, which happens all the time, how does that set a state back? Having laws and policies in place is one, uh, one form of resilience against that, but we haven't done deep dives into what does a good government look like? What does a government say from the state of Acre, Brazil, which is always known as the forest government of the world and constantly talks as a leader, what were the conditions that made that happen? And I've personally witnessed it, but I have not done scholarship diving deeply into how a governor pulls in members of his or her administration to make things happen for forests and climate and people. Um, what are the needs and capacities of subnational governments? Like I say, we consult on this all the time because we go right to the source and say, what do you need? What's working, what's not working? New interdisciplinary collaborative research. We are starting to do all this stuff. Um, UCLA, our co-global uh, secretariat has a postdoc that's going to be looking at decision-making and motivation around forest governance. Forest citizenship and governance, like I mentioned, uh, is a project we're working on. Gender and human rights. Um, I'm currently writing an article with uh, a number of women leaders in Brazil on gender and what look what forest conservation at the intersection of gender and forest conservation and access to these spaces of power and privilege. Um, bioeconomy development and international research networks. I mentioned that's with USAID. We mentioned the safeguards. And then recently we've been talking with the Inter-American Development Bank about communication systems across places like the Amazon. So they work beyond Brazil, but the whole Amazon and uh, the new director of Amazonia is a longtime friend and supporter of the GCF. And she said, what about if we got other secretaries beyond just the environmental secretary involved? What if we had the secretary of planning of communications of health? And we focused on communication systems, which can then be alert systems for deforestation is happening here. We need telehealth here. We need education here. So it's kind of a win-win that helps the forest and conservation agenda, but also goes beyond that. Thank you. Oh, ongoing opportunities, I just had to mention, I mean, yesterday was huge, huge election in Brazil. The presidential election will be going to the runoff, but we had Sonia Guajajara was elected in Sao Paulo um, as the first federal deputy, the indigenous federal deputy. And our global committee, a number of these people are on our global committee. And we were just with them last week or two weeks ago in New York. And this was written in the New York Times a couple of days ago about indigenous leaders and climate change. So figuring out, I woke up this morning and I was like, what can I do? Maybe I can call on Carlos Nobre and other Brazilian scientists to do a scientist letter supporting Lula. I mean, there's no doubt that Bolsonaro has been not a, a friend for the environment. As I can say, we work with everybody. But, because I know this is being recorded, but we do need things to be changed in Brazil. And subnational governments have to work with national governments, whoever they are. But there's no doubt that having a new national government in Brazil would be better for forest climate and people. And interaction with new elected off officials and leaders. Peru just got three new governors that we're going to be interacting with. So those are some ideas. And I think... That's it. Thank you. Here's the GCF website, my own website, all that stuff. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Thanks. Um, so this is super interesting. And um, but I, I guess one question I had for you for you about kind of the the organization is um, what have efforts looked like to 
try to make inroads into places where you see like unitary systems, right? So when you don't have federalist governments <laughs> and you don't have that kind of independent authority that's like, you know, so is that relying on trying to approach an, a, another level of government or is it an NGO based strategy mm -hmm. in places where you, you know, so I was thinking about like the map you put up where you, mm -hmm. you guys have had, and I see like, it, it doesn't look like a lot of success in Africa. And to me as a political scientist, I see, okay, a lot of unitary systems. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. So I was kind of curious about kind of what, what the strategy has been um, for the organization and, and what the future might hold on, on those kinds of things. Yeah, that's a great question. So I can speak to also Peru. Governors there, they're governors of regions and they are only governors for one term. It's not a federalist system. And we still work with them and do as much as we possibly can in the four years. But we also have a strategy of you need the other partnerships. So NGOs provide us with staying power over time. Because if you think these governors are leaving in four years, we don't have that much time to get them socialized, to get policies in place. But NGOs can come in and they can help provide um, some continuity. We also work with key donor governments. So one thing I didn't mention in this presentation is most of our funding comes from the government of Norway, which is the largest climate donor in the world. And using pressure from the international community. So Norway talking with, I realize, you know, I'm using Norway to represent a person, but like having a Norwegian talk with key leaders in the, pres in the uh, presidential administration, like I mentioned in Peru, is really, really important. Because then you have international eyes on this agenda. And again, it's a bit of a carrot and a stick approach too, because you want to get people bought into the agenda. And at the same time, they have to know that it's going to financially make sense. Like, what are they going to get out of this? Are they going to get more votes? Are they going to get more funding for their state or province? What's the win for them? In Africa, that we've wanted to expand our presence over there. And that's honestly been a lack of capacity. I'm being real honest here. Um, on the part of the Global Secretariat. And we've had, it's, it's hard when you don't have clusters of states and provinces. So in Africa, we've got Nigeria, which is um, uh, cross river state, and then Cavalier and Belier in Cote d'Ivoire. When you only have three states, it's really hard for us to give them the amount of care that they require. For example, getting them to Peru next week, it looks like they're probably not going to get to Peru because they need visas and their plane ticket is $6,000. And there's no one person that's helping with Africa as an entire continent again, too. Congo Basin would be another natural member. And that's why we're excited about this partnership with UCLA. So thinking where can we have the most impact and working across entire regions really does help. Yeah. Questions? You pick me, Lori, we pick you. <laughs> <laughs> that was when you were asking a question to the group at the beginning. It's like, pick me, pick me. Wait, hold on, Lori. <laughs> you can't hear me. <laughs> it's like the price is right here. <laughs> I think it's supposed to come from that way. Okay, is your microphone Did I win? On, Did I win? No. If, if you... We're figuring this out. It's okay. Okay, try again. Hello? No. It's okay. You can go on. Oh, yeah. You can. Recording in progress. Hello? Oh, I think now. You can go on to. Can... Hello? You're good. Okay. I. You could go to someone in the room. I don't, <laughs> but okay. Um, you can hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Um, two things. One, and I'm sorry, I just missed some of what you just said, but have you talked about, you, I thought you said at the beginning, you also have governors or um, leaders in Mexico. 
Yes. I'd be curious to to know what what where they are, what they're interested in, and what kind of work you've done with them. And then um, another question is: This is so fantastic that you're introducing this to the IBS community, and I'm so excited. Are there really logical next steps that you'd like to see to make sure that we build some exciting bridges? Thank you. Certainly. Certainly. Okay. I turn that off. Then we'll back. Okay. Hold on one second. We've got some weird Star Wars thing going on. Okay, much better. All right, <laughs> this is just kind of fun. <laughs> it keeps you on your toes. Um, so Mexico, yes, we are working with a number of states in Mexico. We have a couple things going on there. Number one, Mexico is our new co-chair along with Peru. So we're having this meeting in Peru next week. And it's the first time we're having a technical workshop exchange, which I'm super excited about. Hillary here in the room, who's an environmental PhD student, is going to help us with knowledge management. Because when you get people together and you're in this, you're in the field and you're seeing different places, what, what does that translate into beyond a really cool field trip? So Hillary has that, that task of figuring that out. Um, no pressure. But the, to answer your question, Lori, so we're going to go from Peru, we're going to go from there to Yucatan, and the next annual meeting is going to be in February in Yucatan, and I'm having a conversation today with the governor of Yucatan because I'm trying to convince him to get to Peru so that we can be a more unified network. When governors stick together, they have much more power. And working with the Mexican governors is going to be our next really big thing. There's a lot of conflict going on right now between the federal government in Mexico and the states, particularly around carbon market opportunities. Jalisco and uh, Yucatan are some of the farthest along states, and we work with the secretaries of environment there. Um, Jalisco has a very cool project, deforestation free tequila, that we've been working on for the entire state of Jalisco, which is a success case. And then we're also, to be really honest, Lori, we're working to engage more Mexican governors because we found that there are some leaders and there are some laggards. And again, they're better if they're together. For next, so so stay tuned on that because all eyes are going to be on Mexico starting like three weeks from now when we're done with Peru. Um, and then in terms of logical next steps, I really think collaborative interdisciplinary project development using the GCF as a platform is a place we need to go. You can see with this transition in the government in the global secretariat, we're staying involved, we're staying deeply embedded in universities. And how can we use this platform, which is not adequately used right now at all by political scientists, by geographers, by all sorts of interdisciplinary scholars? How can we use this to come up with data that then can inform decision making? For us, getting to a governor, that's super easy. But having the data and the robust scholarship around it and figuring out how to package that, that's what we need to do better at. So particularly, I'm really, really excited to be in IBS because we can do this stuff, which is good. So I'm, my main thing, if you just, if you only remember one thing today, it's know about this platform and figure out how you can use this instrumentally in your work, because we need you. And we've got the platform already set. I feel like we've got the, the easy stuff done, which is bringing people at the table and now how can new research, like I just showed you on deforestation and poverty, how can that help inform our work? If you read deeper in that article in Manga Bay, they say that they don't have adequate research on payment for ecosystem services and how this benefits forest-based populations. So, all right, that's a natural research area that we should be doing. Okay, are we good? Thanks, Larry. Other questions? Yes. We've got a voice from Brazil. Thanks, Tony. Uh, what are the main challenges that you are facing uh, since Bolsonaro started 
is government. And uh, if you have uh, research on in the, the group of climate litigation, that's a new area of law studies. Yes, we definitely, I'm gonna answer those in reverse order. We have a lot of research on climate litigation and we work with litigators in states and provinces. Um, remember this was born in a law school and Jason Gray, my co-director is a lawyer. So we have some deep roots in different places, you know, be that California or Brazil. Uh, that, that's another area that we could go deeper into, you know, what are the laws and policies that were put into place? What were the structures that enabled those laws and policies to be put into place in places like Acre or Mato Grosso, which kind of looked at Acre's laws and policies and adapted them to a Mato Grosso context. One other piece that can be changed or adapted across the network is the government of Mato Grosso, Brazil, which is the largest agricultural state in all of Brazil, has interesting councils that work with indigenous leaders. So is that model something that's viable for other places? And how are those councils established? Are they legally established for durability over administrative change or not? Um, and one thing, Joe, I'll just mention, six out of the nine GCF governors in the Brazilian Amazon were reelected yesterday. Um, and that means that we don't have to trot around and say, welcome to the GCF, this is who we are. Uh, but it's a huge opportunity to, when we're at the COP together, say, you got four years now, what's your plan? Deforestation is rising horrifically in the Brazilian Amazon. The international governmental community, the international community is looking at this, what is your plan here? Um, and then to your first question, the biggest challenges with the Bolsonaro government. So this is super specific and technical. Um, Enter into agreements with carbon markets, subnational governments, so states and provinces need a letter from the national government endorsing that. This is an issue with Mexico too. Uh, the Bolsonaro government has not said that they will give the states the letter of endorsement so that they can get a share of the benefits. So we are constantly trying to negotiate with them by saying if states actually this is an if because it's not happening. If states can show that they can reduce deforestation, they will get financial benefits from this. But we have to have the structures that allow the financial benefits to flow through the national governments. Because remember the LEAF coalition that I mentioned is the US, the UK and Norway. So it's national governments working to national governments. So it's really been challenging to get that opening of the door with the national government. That said, we work with national governments because we take the world as we find it and we need their permission. So having a totally confrontational approach is not helpful. Um, and I did see some uh, recent research that was showing that over the past couple months, I believe, a lot of land tenure has been, a number of land tenure uh, cases have been awarded to family farmers under the Bolsonaro government. So I'm curious about like, what does that mean? Was this a pre-election ruse? What's going on here? We've had a lot of challenges with the Bolsonaro government and our donors have had challenges, but um, you know, we, again, we recognize we need to work with any government, but it will be problematic if Bolsonaro is reelected. I can't say it in any other way. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wait, 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 hold on. Um, I came in late, so I might have missed this, but I'm just wondering whether uh, this collaboration between other networks too, like the uh, C40 network or the Resilient Cities network to kind of learn, you know, uh, is to promote subnational action really works and what is problematic because they've existed for quite some time now. Absolutely. That was a great question on the different climate networks. Yes, we do a lot of collaboration. We had um, a three-year MOU, and this is the next steps, Laurie, too. 
Um, we had a three-year MOU with C4, the Center for International Forestry Research. We now have a new MOU we're getting established with CIAT in Brazil because USAID works regularly with this network and wants to channel funding not from the Brazilian USAID to the Global North back to Brazil, but keep it in Brazil, which makes total sense. So we have MOUs around what it's going to look like to fund a project and then outcomes, which then could feed back um, to the research that we're doing. We also work with the climate group and that's another global network. And uh, we had climate pathways projects in some key states in Mexico, Brazil, I think it was Peru. I think that was mainly it. So we depend on other networks. And with the C4 partnership, and this is something we could put on our website, we have uh, a number of papers that have come out of the GCF as a platform. Now that said, and this is the opportunity for IBS, I find that oftentimes academic researchers are writing their papers and they're using the GCF as a platform to collect data and come up with some findings. Translating that and getting it into the hands of practitioners, the secretaries of the environment, or the super busy governors who are like, give me the soundbite, what do I need to do? And then they look at the secretary of the environment and say, what should we do? What, what do you think? Because the secretaries are the key decision makers. So I think we need better translation of academic findings into the people that are making decisions here. Yeah. Please, at, please jump in on collaboration with other networks. This would be great. This is Jason, who is up there on the far right, the new co-director. I'm so happy that he is my partner in everything here. All right, go ahead, Jason. Wait, hold on. We, we need to get your sound on. Let's try it. Okay, try it. How's that working? Nope. Hold on. <laughs> we did it before, so we're, we're thinking we can do it again. How's that? Is that working? All right. Hi, everybody. Colleen, this is great. Thanks for letting me listen in on here. And I, at some point, would love to meet you all. I think that's something we're really excited about, of making sure there's two amazing universities in the U.S. that are supporting our network and expanding it to other areas of, of study and, and uh, collaborators. Uh, on, that was a really good question on, on collaboration with other networks. And that's something that we've been working on for, for quite some time. Uh, some of you may be familiar with like Regions 40, there's an R4, there's under two coalition. Um, one of the things we wanna make sure from the, the GCF secretariat level is that we're not reinventing the wheel on collaborations and also that we're supporting our delegates, many of whom are on, they're the delegates for all, all these different types of collaboration networks. Um, the GCF actually, we're, we're one of the older ones. So for example, the under two coalition, which uh, also came out of California. Uh, when that first started, we brought in 23 members to that coalition right away. And it's really offered an opportunity to sort of leapfrog on the creation of these networks. Um, so the GCF task force members are really focused on climate and environment as it expands beyond that. Under two coalition is also focused on climate, but they also look at different types of, of areas that's outside of forests. So electricity, renewables, et cetera. And I think it's offered a way to, to partner on on the kind of the niche areas of each network, but making sure we're not reinventing something. So I think that's a great question. It's something we're also trying to figure out how to, how to do better uh, and also expand those. So um, I think through through IBS, um, very excited to, to see how that can expand and improve and uh, excited to join you all. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Ooh, we got a weird thing going again. Okay, wait, wait, hold on one sec. Yeah, we're good. Okay, we're good. Um, and I want you to know that this is your new colleague up here, Jason Gray. This is part, as he said, of the interinstitutional network that we've got going on right now. So it's great that you can meet everybody virtually and we'll have to get you out here and vice versa. All right, thank you. I know we're out of time now, but um, I'm located along with Marta, right down in the first floor, 125. So when you see GCF now, you know what that black box is. We've opened it up. Thank you all.